So without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Joe McFadden to begin our webinar portion on choline. Welcome everyone. Uh, today's presentation is going to last about 30 minutes. It was designed to provide you with a general overview and introduction to choline biology and nutrition in the transition dairy cow. Some of the slides have details that I might not discuss. However, the majority of these slides can be made available to you uh, upon request. First, we will review transition cow biology. Time will be spent discussing key concepts pertaining to transition cow metabolism. In part, we will review the role of fat mobilization and hepatic gluconeogenesis. In doing so, I hope to provide you with a framework uh, to better define the causes of fatty liver disease, uh, ketosis, and other metabolic disorders that develop in the postpartum dairy cow. Uh, second, we will review the origins of choline research, focus on what is choline, how choline is metabolized, and what functions choline elicits. We will focus our attention on liver triglyceride secretion uh, in the transition cow. Third, we will review the need for rumen-protected choline by describing rumen choline degradation and the effects that choline feeding has on milk production, uh, liver metabolism, and postpartum metabolic disease. We will also take on some key, home, key take home messages that have emer emerged from some recent meta-analyses uh, pertaining to choline feeding in dairy cows. Although likely obvious to many of you, it is important to realize that the dairy cow transitioning from gestation to lactation experiences marked increases in energy demand. Increased demand is driven by increased energy requirements to support late-term fetal growth and milk production. Unfortunately, the transition dairy cow will experience appetite suppression, which limits energy intake, as shown in panel A. The outcome is negative energy balance, which can persist until peak milk production. The key feature by which the cow responds to negative energy balance is by enhancing body fat mobilization, reflected by a decrease in body condition during the peripartum. Indeed, uh, we can appreciate that body fat breakdown increases circulating fatty acids. Uh, these fatty acids serve as key energy substrate molecules for oxidation, provides the cow with ATP. In addition, the fatty acids are utilized by the mammary gland to produce milk fat. In addition, the fatty acids um, increasing during the transition period, there's dramatic reductions in circulating insulin concentrations that develop in these animals. In part, this supports, explains why adipose tissue lipogenesis is suppressed and body fat breakdown is enhanced. In addition, the postpartum cow experiences a reduction in the sensitivity and responsiveness to insulin, which can contribute to body fat breakdown. The liver and muscle are tissue sites for glycogen, which is readily utilized by the transition cow to provide glucose. It is important to emphasize that this is only a short-term source of glucose, therefore the cow relies on hepatic gluconeogenesis uh, to support glucose production. Additionally, the breakdown of fatty acids and generation of acetyl-CoA will support the production of ketones like beta-hydroxybutyrate, which spares glucose utilization for the mammary synthesis of milk. Panel A demonstrates some classic work showing that during late gestation and ruminants, nearly half of all maternal glucose supply is directed towards the growing fetus. In lactation, glucose is needed to make milk lactose, and total glucose turnover by the mammary gland will increase three to four-fold postpartum. And panel B shows how catecholamine responsiveness will actually increase in the transition cows as well, and explains why plasma fatty acids increase. A healthy liver is important for the transition dairy cow, and it's reflected by unimpeded glucose production. In cows, hepatic glucose output increases from pre to postpartum. Although propionate, derived from the rumen, remains the precursor for gluconeogenesis, the cow will rely on other precursors, including alanine from muscle breakdown and glycerol from adipose tissue breakdown. A healthy liver would completely oxidize fatty acids to carbon dioxide and provide ketones to circulation, but within moderation. It is recognized that fatty acid oxidation, which is the breakdown of fatty acids, predominates in the mitochondria. However, peroxisomal oxidation of very long chain fatty acids will also increase in the transition cow. A healthy liver is able to dispose of triglyceride in the form of very low density lipoproteins. The inadequate oxidation of fatty acids and limited secretion of triglyceride within lipoproteins can result in the accumulation of triglyceride in the liver and cause fatty liver disease. So 
So from a general perspective, fatty liver is caused by over-conditioning dry cows by exceeding dietary ener energy requirements throughout gestation and having prolonged dry periods that contribute to excessive body weight gain during late gestation. Both of these factors contribute to a high body condition score at calving. Low postpartum dietary energy, the absence of close-up diet for the prime and rumen environment and papillae development, and increased number of lactations are also risk factors for fatty liver and related disorders. Environmental stressors such as overstocking pens and heat stress are also potential contributors. From a mechanistic perspective, the key cause is severe body fat mobilization. As you would expect, fatter cows mobilize more body fat. Research suggests that these animals are experiencing a greater degree of insulin resistance. The result is an increase in fatty acid uptake by the liver. And that fatty acid profile mimics um, the fatty acid profile of adipose tissue. In turn, you know, the cow can't oxidize all that fatty acid, and reesterification occurs, and triglyceride accumulates. Another likely contributor to fat deposition in the liver is limited secretion of triglyceride within very low density lipoproteins. proteins. You know, it's really interesting right now that current research is focused on other factors as well, specifically the role of gut-derived endotoxin and microbial metabolites as triggers of fatty liver disease, but certainly this requires more study uh, in the transition dairy cow. The increase in uh, liver fatty acid uptake and triglyceride deposition has potential to reduce gluconeogenesis and deplete liver glycogen stores, both of which may reduce circulating glucose and thus lower milk production. In panel A, cows are fed diets to maintain body, a moderate body condition or overconditioning. Overconditioning dry cows increase postpartum liver triglycerides. In this study, the activity of fossil enolpyruvate carboxykinase, which is a key enzyme involved in hepatic gluconeogenesis, was also suppressed. In a separate study, cows were identified as having low or high liver fat content, and that's in panel C. Increased liver fat content was related to enhanced ketogenesis, so you can see the increase in beta-hydroxybutyrate. Lastly, in a classic study at Iowa State University, cows were subjected to a ketosis induction protocol that involved a partial feed restriction. And these animals suffered from low milk production uh, during early lactation. It's important to realize that when cows have observed fatty liver and low milk production, other ailments are likely to occur. It's been established that the onset of fatty liver is associated with displaced abomasum, ketosis, both subclinical and clinical, mastitis, and other disorders. This is something I'll talk about a little bit uh, towards the end of the presentation with regard to some of the most recent meta-analyses. In addition, cows that develop severe fatty liver disease may have reduced pregnancy rates, increased days open, delay first estrus, and lower services. Although many nutritional approaches are used to prevent and treat postpartum metabolic disease in dairy cows, which are not going to be talked about today, uh, this presentation does focus on dietary choline therapy, and that's the focus. I wanted to start by talking about the origins of choline, just to provide some historical context. And I thought some of this is pretty interesting. In the 19th century, scientists were interested in defining the chemical composition of living tissues. In 1850, Theodore Gobley at the left was a pharmacist in Paris. He isolated a molecule from brain tissue and carp fish eggs that he called materiae phosphorae, or lecithin, from the Greek term lekathos, or for egg yolk. We now know that this phospholipid is a constituent of most membranes, uh, including VLDL. Soon after, Adolf Strecker in the middle was characterizing the composition of bile, and he found that lecithin from bile, when boiled, produced a new, a new nitrogenous chemical he called choline. The name was derived from the Greek word for bile, referred to as coal. Later, lecithin was characterized chemically as being phosphatidylcholine and not choline per se. The discovery of choline is attributed to Oscar Leibrick on the right. Studying the human brain, Labrick identified a new molecule, which he named norine, which was actually choline. Other researchers that are important in this field include Eugene Kennedy at the University of Chicago, John Brenner and David Greenberg at the University of California, and their roles in better defining choline metabolism. The first evidence that choline was an essential nutrient was derived by work performed by Charles Best and Frederick Banting. Charles was a graduate student that initially worked for Frederick Banting. What is interesting is that their research led to the discovery of insulin. They utilized dogs with their pancreas removed. And what they observed is these dogs developed severe fatty liver disease. Although I don't understand sort of the initial reasoning for why they did this, but the researchers performed 
a series of trials feeding lecithin, which contains choline, to these dogs. In the top excerpt, it describes how the dogs were removed from the lecithin treatment in October. Two months later, these dogs died. Postmortem examination revealed a liver fat content of 22%. In a subsequent study, Dr. Best kept feeding the dogs choline containing lecithin, and these dogs had just a liver fat content of 3.75% when doing so. In a moment, I will share with you that choline feeding is a means to increase phospholipid synthesis and prevent triglyceride deposition in the liver. Now, but first, I wanted to provide you with some facts about choline. It's a water-soluble quaternary ammonium compound and has three methyl groups. As such, it is recognized as a methyl donor. I'm sure many of you have heard that. In the early days, choline was studied within its role as acetylcholine and neurotransmitter, which has implications for you know, muscle function. <coughs> choline is needed as a building block for phospholipids, namely phospholipidylcholine, which are lipids used to form cellular membranes. In the context of today's talk, phosphatidylcholine is an essential component of the monolayer that forms very low-density lipoproteins. You also need to understand that animal diets, and in animal diets, choline supplements are fed as choline chloride, which is a quaternary ammonium salt. Non-ruminant research has established that intestinal choline absorption involves choline transporter-like proteins at low concentrations, and in high concentrations of dietary choline, passive diffusion is an additional mode of transfer. In the enterocyte, choline can be metabolized in, by the gut tissue, which has implications for assessing choline bioavailability in different species, including the cow. The metabolism of choline is moderately complicated, so I'd, I'd spare you for most of the details today. But first, choline can be oxidized to betaine. This involves choline dehydrogenase and betaine aldehyde dehydrogenase. When we feed choline supplements to cows, we often see a betaine response. Betaine has the potential to enter the methionine cycle and form dimethylglycine and methionine, shown in blue. Methionine may in turn be converted to s methionine by a transferase. To make phosphatidylcholine via methylation, three methyl groups in the form of s methionine and a single phosphatidylethanolamine are needed. So to sort of recap this, in order to make phosphatidylcholine, you're going to have to have uh, three methyl groups that could potentially be derived from choline. This pathway is considered the compensatory pathway. The main pathway is the CDP choline pathway, which is on the right. CDP stands for cytidine diphosphate. Choline represents the initial substrate in this pathway, and it's generally accepted that the majority of phosphatidylcholine is made through this pathway. It certainly requires confirmation in the cow, however. I'm not mentioning the importance of fatty acids here, but I'll say that fatty acid composition of these different phosphatidylcholine pools is likely different in cows and influenced by fatty acid feeding. The desired net outcome, however, is the production of this phospholipid, which when combined with apolipoproteins, can package triglyceride for the export in VLDL. In this slide, choline is shown in the blue boxes. In addition to phosphatidylcholine, however, um, it can be found in other types of metabolites, including lysophosphatidylcholine. Now, this lipid is generally recognized as being formed in the intestine in response to choline feeding. It is also a key component of membranes and an emulsifier found in bile. Some of my research focuses on dietary emulsifiers, and I, I want to state that phosphatidylcholine and lysophosphatidylcholine are types of lecithin and lysolecithin, which are common feed ingredients that you're probably aware of. Other types of metabolites involved in choline metabolism include sphingomyelin, acetylcholine, phosphocholine, and glycerophosphocholine. In papers, total choline is often calculated as the sum of all these metabolites. In the cow, research has shown that the stage of lactation influences choline and choline-related metabolite status. In panel A, plasma total, cho total choline is lowest immediately after calving, which is predominantly driven by changes in phosphatidylcholine. In a similar manner, milk phosphatidylcholine concentrations are lowest immediately postpartum. You can see that in panel B. And this is the same for, uh, for choline and other choline-related metabolites. One exception, however, is phosphocholine. It's a storage form for choline, and its concentrations are highest during early lactation. Now, the thought is, is that phosphocholine is a key nutrient in milk that can help aid in calf development. It is important to realize that choline as free choline, or the metabolites of it, are found in various feed ingredients already. 
Now, this table shows MIGs of choline for 100 grams of each feed ingredient. For instance, anyone that is familiar with betaine feeding knows that bee pulp is a uh, go-to source for betaine supplements. In a corn silage, choline and betaine will contain more choline but less phosphatidylcholine compared to corn grain. In some fat supplements, you use complex choline-containing phospholipids as emulsifiers. Although choline is found in feed, however, unprotected choline is rapidly degraded in the rumen. We expect the clear majority of choline in these feed ingredients, 80 to 99 percent of choline, to be degraded in the rumen. Early work by Sharma and Erdman helped to find this in vitro. They showed that lysophosphatidylcholine, but also choline chloride, was rapidly disappeared in rumen fluid incubations, 97 percent within the first hour. Choline in corn silage or grain had slightly lower rates of degradation, but was still quite extensive. Now, fish meal is rich in choline, nearly 10 times that is found in corn silage, but its rate of degradation exceeds 85%. I wanted to mention this because the paper actually had an interesting quote, and it said that if the post-ruminal choline requirement was 30 grams per day, and the cow would need to consume approximately 40 kilos per day of fish meal. And that's a bit unrealistic, and I'm sure many of you can understand that. So if you have extensive rumen degradation, it would be reasonable to anticipate that flow to the duodenum, is, uh, to the intestine, is also quite, quite low. And so Sharma and Erdman took the next step uh, to really evaluate this, and they fed Holstein late lactation cows a corn silage-based TMR and utilized a Latin square design. Choline intake for the control treatment was 23 grams per day. Uh, but when they were fed um, high amounts, either 10 or 20 grams per kilo ration dry matter, this equated to feeding them 176 or 326 grams per day of choline. That's incredibly high. All right. They then measured the flow of choline to the duodenum, and feeding approximately four times as much choline only increased flow of the choline to the small intestine from 1.2 to 2.5 grams per day. That's relatively nothing. Um, what they did see, though, is they feeding this choline at high concentrations did modify rumen fermentation. Uh, they observed reductions in propionate, uh, increased acetate to propionate ratio, and rumen ammonia concentrations uh, were also increased and dry matter intake was suppressed. It was concluded that unprotected choline feeding cannot increase post-ruminal choline supply. And so research uh, aimed to investigate the effects of post-ruminal choline delivery. Early trials have focused on the abomasal infusion of choline. I, it's, you know, I've read the literature for a while now, and it's my general sense that most of this early work also came out of the lab of Dr. Erdman at the University of Maryland. In panel A, 60 grams per day of choline was infused in the abomasum for two weeks in Holstein cows. And you can see that it increases in milk. In a separate experiment involving four cows, the abomasal infusion of 25 to 75 grams per day increased in milk choline concentrations. These early studies did not observe any effects on milk yield, however, this is most certainly because of small study populations. More recently, Dr. DeVath, Dr. Gerard, and colleagues took a more sophisticated approach to assess choline bioavailability in response to post-ruminal choline administration. Specifically, they had five late lactation Holstein cows um, with five-day treatment periods in a five-by-five five Latin square arrangement. Now, the treatments consisted of unsupplemented control, 12.5 or 25 grams per day of choline is rumen protected choline. That is a top dress 12 times per day, so every two hours, or 12.5 or 25 grams per day of choline continuously infused into the abomasum. That's as choline chloride. They then measured arterial plasma concentrations and a net portal flux of choline and choline related metabolites. In brief, the post ruminal delivery of choline increased arterial betaine choline, phosphocholine, and lysophosphatidylcholine concentrations. In addition, the post-ruminal delivery of unprotected choline increased the net portal flux of choline, but not other choline-related metabolites. In milk, post-ruminal choline administration in the form of rumen-protected choline, or this abomasal infusion of choline chloride, increased milk betaine, choline, acetylcholine, phosphocholine, and total choline concentrations. No effect, though, was observed for more of the complex lipid, uh, phospholipids. These authors concluded that plasma and milk concentrations of betaine, or in a combination with phosphocholine, were found to be the strongest markers of choline bioavailability in dairy cows. In my own studies, we would agree that betaine is very responsive to choline feeding, 
Uh, but we've also in, uh, observed increases in dimethylglycine as being very responsive. So sort of a key take home message here, if anyone's evaluate, evaluating the literature, and that is choline is rapidly metabolized uh, to other choline-related metabolites. And so if, if you do not see a, a particular choline uh, response, maybe in a publication, uh, it's, it's possible that uh, choline was still absorbed, it was just metabolized to other metabolic fates like betaine. Although Charles Best and Frederick Banting made the observation that choline containing lecithin prevented fatty liver in those dogs prone to the disease, it really wasn't until the 80s and 90s, and now when the fields of study started to explode, and this is in due in part to uh, the efforts of Dr. Dennis and Gene Vance at the University of Alberta. Basically, they were able to, some of the first data demonstrating this, at least in non-ruminants. And these early, this early data show that deficiency of choline reduced the circulating VLDL. And just pointing to this bands right here, the choline deficient diet, these rodents had less VLDL in circulation. They also had lower amounts of apolipoproteins that are found in VLDL in circulation. And then finally, the animals that were fed the choline deficient diet had lower levels of phospholipid, that key phospholipid, but dramatic increases in circulating triglyceride. That's circulating triglyceride, excuse me, um, triglyceride in the liver. So this is some of the early evidence that choline deficiency can cause fatty liver disease in non-ruminants, and that the reduction in um, secretion within uh, triglyceride secretion within VLDL was the cause. At the University of Wisconsin, Dr. White has the ability to culture bovine neonatal hepatocytes cultured with or without a fatty acid cocktail to mimic the transition cow. In doing so, her group utilized this experimental model to test the effects of choline chloride. She was able to observe an increase in VLDL in the culture medium. This observation was not observed, however, with methionine treatment. Not shown here, their investigation also showed that choline and methionine differentially, differentially regulated the expression of genes involved in methylation. And choline treatment was also able to reduce reactive oxygen species, which are a measure of oxidative stress. So there might be some implications there. My lab is, is aimed to study the relationship between phosphatidylcholine status and fatty liver disease in transition dairy cows. We currently have a manuscript in preparation that describes a study where we categorize cows as not having fatty liver disease or having moderate fatty liver disease, that being over 12% liver lipid. We then measured over 300 different types of lipids in plasma. We then generated these fancy plots here to identify which lipids were most representative of fatty liver disease. The top features were low concentrations of highly unsaturated phosphatidylcholines. Although it's not shown here, we repeated this approach by classifying cows as having low or high circulating fatty acids or low or high circulating ketones. Across all of these analyses, we consistently demonstrated that low plasma phosphatidylcholines were related to fatty liver, high circulating fatty acids, and ketones. These data would suggest that if choline feeding can increase phosphatidylcholine production, then fatty liver may be prevented in transition cows receiving choline therapy. This hypothesis was attested a little bit further uh, with a sample set from the late Dr. Staples at the University of Florida. His investigative team studied late gestation dairy cows that had lived or feed restricted to 30% of their net energy requirements. They were fed rumen protected choline to provide up to 25.8 grams per day of choline ion. Although circulating choline did not change, uh, they observed linear increases in plasma lysophosphatidylcholine and sphingomyelin in both dietary groups. They also observed marked reductions in liver triglyceride deposition with increasing choline dose. That's what you see here. We acquired these samples, uh, plasma samples, from the, the Staples Research Group and performed a chromatography method to isolate various lipoprotein fractions. The triglyceride rich fraction on the left contains a VLDL. We observed increases in triglyceride and cholesterol. And the fraction containing low density lipoproteins we detected a linear increase in triglycerides. Uh, we also observed an increase in cholesterol in that triglyceride-rich fraction shown here, and we saw an increase in triglycerides linearly in low-density lipoproteins, as well as phospholipids in low-density lipoproteins. These data were sort of the first evidence to show that rumen protected choline feeding up to 25.8 grams per day uh, of choline ion was able to increase triglyceride in, within a VLDL 
um, plasma fraction. So we didn't really know, though, if choline was increasing phosphatidylcholine production. And so in this, we took those same fractions. And so we took the VLDL fraction, but also liver, and measured phosphatidylcholines in response to ribbon-protected choline feeding. Uh, and this is actually, this, uh, this represents 0, 6, 0, 120 grams per day of the actual product. Um, and what we observed was there was a marked increase in uh, phosphatidylcholines uh, within the VLDL fraction. And so this just showed, sort of connects the puzzle that choline feeding was able to increase phosphatidylcholine synthesis and increase the release of triglyceride within VLDL. So more recent work uh, as well from Dr. Lohr at the University of Illinois, he's used primary liver cells enriched in hepatocytes derived from mid-lactation cows. And the thought here was to try to better understand um, how does choline um, modulate of the synthesis of phosphatidylcholine. So they looked at the gene expression of different genes involved in both of those previous pathways I talked to you about, the methylation pathway and the CDP choline pathway. And they were able to see an increase in the expression of choline kinase, right? And so that's sort of shown right here. Choline kinase converts choline to phosphocholine, um, which, you know, it makes sense. Based on the non-ruminant literature, uh, the majority of phosphatidylcholine is made through that pathway. So now I want to take a moment and go get into a little bit of the production benefits here of choline feeding. And this really started out in the late 80s and early 90s. And this was an original study of 48 early lactation Holstein cows, also by Erdman and Sharma. And they fed rumen protected choline from 0 to 0.234% of ration dry matter, which equated to 0 to 51 grams per day of choline chloride. On the low end, they were feeding 16.9 grams per day of choline chloride, and that's just around 12 grams per day of choline ion. The main finding was that they observed a tendency for increased milk yield without a change in dry matter intake. In a separate study, they were able to study the effects uh, that these feeding, choline feeding levels had on either a 13% or 16.5% crude protein diet. The result was that rumen protected choline feeding was able to increase milk yield. So this was an early study led to a series of many other studies in the past three decades evaluating rumen protected choline feeding. I just want to talk just about a few of them here with you and some of the, some of the main conclusions. Now, Hartwell and co-workers at Purdue University observed that the effects of rumen protected choline feeding on milk production depended on the amount of rumen undegradable protein in the diet. Specifically, if they observed increase in milk production when cows were fed a lower rumen undegradable protein diet. They were also able to demonstrate that choline feeding had the ability to lower liver triglyceride concentrations in cows. And this really happened in animals that had a body condition score over 3.75 and animals that were suffering from lower dry matter intakes. Now, this makes sense because these are certainly risk factors for fatty liver disease. In the middle, at Cornell University, Tom Overton studied the effects of rumen protected choline feeding on transition cow liver health. In this particular study, choline feeding tended to increase yields of milk fat, 3.5% fat corrected milk, I'm not really showing that here. In liver, the capacity for uh, to store palmitase, that's a saturated fatty acid, as triglyceride did it, um, was reduced when feeding uh, this rumen protected choline supplement. They also observed an increase in liver glycogen concentrations with choline feeding. Uh, that would be indicating that the liver had um, an adequate supply of glycogen for later use. So an indicator of good liver health. Um, it also would suggest that that lower um, palmitate esterification um, might, might also suggest that uh, they were, um, were making less triglyceride. And then finally, in the bottom, the study at the bottom, this is actually in Italy, and they were fed either, uh, these cows were fed zero or 20 grams per day of choline chloride from minus 14 to 30 days relative to cattle. In short, milk production increased with choline feeding. They had lower circulating fatty acids at calving. Uh, they didn't see any changes in ketone levels, though, in this particular study, but did see an increase in circulating vitamin E. And that's interesting because uh, vitamin E is an antioxidant. And it's often low, too, in transition cows. Uh, they really didn't sort of elaborate on the mechanisms of that, but I thought that was interesting. Now, at the University of Guelph, this is at the top here by Sahara in, in 2006, cows uh, received rumen protected choline produced 1.2 kilos 
more milk per day in the first 60 days of lactation. Uh, but its effects were mainly attributed to cows that had a very high body condition score. Uh, interestingly, when they looked at the cows that had the higher body condition, those animals actually ate one kilo more dry matter during the transition period. In the middle, um, Ellick and co-workers were able to show increased milk yield, milk cooling content and yield, lower liver triglycerides, and uh, as well as lower circulating ketones. Um, I thought, just to keep this truly international, that middle study was from Hungary. This one is from the Netherlands at the bottom. They demonstrated that rumen-protected choline feeding increased milk protein yield, lowered liver triglycerides, and increased the expression of genes involved in VLDL assembly. And finally, uh, work from the Lore Lab has investigated potential interactions between methionine and choline feeding. They fed either 0 or 17 grams per day of choline chloride to cows, the diets low or high in metabolizable methionine. It did not detect any increase in yields of milk or milk components, but did see increased blood glucose and insulin concentrations with choline feeding. And on the bottom, I previously described the work by Dr. Staples, who demonstrated the ability of increasing rumen protected choline feeding to increase liver glycogen and decrease liver triglyceride concentrations in a linear manner. That's what I showed you prior. The same group also explored the interactions between choline feeding and prepartum dietary energy. Uh, these cows were fed in excess of requirements or at maintenance. They observed a reduction in the prevalence of subclinical hypocalcemia and increased milk yield. So I want to finish the talk by focusing on some recent meta-analyses. A meta-analysis is a study of studies, and it can be a powerful means to identify consistent biological outcomes. All right? In 2010, uh, researchers from the Czech Republic had sort of the first meta-analysis, as, as I'm aware of, in 2010, uh, investigating approximately a dozen rumen-protected choline feeding trials. The choline chloride content of the supplement did vary uh, across the studies from 25 to 50 percent, and the reported rumen stability ranged from 20 to over 87 percent. When rumen-protected choline supplementation increased from 6 to 50 grams per day, Marginal milk yield responses decreased from approximately 130 grams to just under a gram of milk per gram of rumen protected choline. But importantly here, milk yield, which is the dotted line, was greatest at 20 grams per day of rumen protected choline feeding. It's choline chloride. With regard to milk protein, the marginal milk protein yield reduced with increasing choline feeding, and milk protein yield was greatest at 50 grams per day of rumen protected choline feeding. Meta-analysis concluded that you know, they didn't see any changes here in milk fat content um, with choline feeding. And in contrast, the authors did um, see that milk protein content was improved uh, with choline feeding and postulated that uh, because choline acts as a methyl donor, right, and that um, methyl donors, those methyl donors could help to form methionine in the liver, that choline has this methionine sparing effect. And allows the mammary gland to um, use methionine for milk protein production. You know, it's a pretty exciting time in the choline sort of research field because there was a meta-analysis, two meta-analyses that were recently published. I'm going to present one with you here. Uh, this one is very recent. And this is from the Santos lab at the University of Florida. They had a revamped meta-analysis of choline feeding. It's been a while since 2010. So, in short, it involved 21 experiments with up to 66 treatment means and over 1,300 cows. The amount of choline ion fed ranged from 0 to 25 grams per day of choline ion. The first observation was that dry matter intake, pre and postpartum, increased with rumen protected choline feeding. Moreover, yields of milk and energy corrected milk also increased. Interestingly, I wanted to provide this quote from the paper because I think it has, it has major implications. I sort of I put that on the left hand side. The author stated that the observed increase in dry matter intake of 0.5 kilos per day would likely support at least one kilo of energy corrected milk, or 50% of the observed response to choline feeding. This means that the ability of choline to increase milk yield likely involves other factors besides an increase in dry matter intake. Uh, for instance, choline is believed to increase lipid transport to the mammary gland, so it's providing the mammary gland energy, but also substrate for milk fat production. And there's some biomedical evidence even that choline can increase uh, the proliferation of mammary epithelial cell. I think that's pretty interesting stuff. The authors also investigate the effects of choline feeding on prepartum and postpartum body weight and body condition score. 
And, you know, common feeding level right now is 12.9 grams per day of choline ion per day. And they uh, notice that at this feeding level of choline ion, they had increased transition cow body weight and body condition score, both during the prepartum right, and the postpartum uh, periods. You know, increases in body weight and body condition uh, with choline feeding may contribute to reduced hepatic fatty acid uptake and uh, reduction in fatty liver disease. Right? And so this meta-analysis actually did observe lower circulating fatty acids with choline feeding. So this sort of all makes sense. In the same meta-analysis, CALS provided 12.9 grams per day of choline ion produced 0.15 pounds more milk fat and 0.1 pounds more protein which probably explains the increase in energy correcting milk that you saw. Uh, there was no effect on milk protein content, but choline had a weak quadratic effect on milk fat content. So somewhere in the middle, right around 50 grams of choline ion, there was a small increase in, in milk fat content. These data demonstrate that feeding 12.9 grams per day of choline ion per day resulted in approximately 3.5 pounds more milk and 3.8 pounds more energy corrected milk. All right, and you sort of see that mainly here on, on the left-hand side of both figures. Uh, but what is interesting is that the effect of choline feeding on milk yield and energy-corrected milk is highly dependent upon dietary metabolizable methionine content. So that's what these figures try to explain. I'll go through this. At a low dietary metabolizable methionine level, as a percent of MP, gains in milk yield and energy-corrected milk are more pronounced. And so here you're dealing with the unsupplemented group at the bottom, a supplemented group at the bottom, and increasing doses here. And so you can see the increment and change in milk yield is increasing with the increase in choline ion feeding. All right, so for instance, in a diet with low metabolizable methionine, right around 1.8% here, uh, supplementing 12.9 grams per day of choline ion resulted in an increment of two kilos more energy-corrected milk. But when metabolizable methionine increased in the diet to 2.3%, the increment of increase was just around one kilo. This is just one example in this final slide here of, of how uh, rumen protected choline feeding can Im improve um, health, but and re most importantly, reduce uh, postpartum diseases. Uh, and this was a study done in, uh, at the University of Florida as well. And they were feeding rumen protected choline before and after calving. Um, has been, and what they observed was a reduction in, in ketonuria. Uh, these animals had reduction in subclinical ketosis, and they had um, a decrease in the incidence of mastitis and a decrease in the incidence of postpartum disease, represented as the sum of retained placenta, metritis, clinical ketosis, DAs, and mastitis. You know, uh, this work was involved over 350 cows. It's certainly hard to study the. Um, Disease incidence requires a lot of animals, but they were able to achieve these outcomes with 350 animals. And I'm not showing in here, but that recent meta-analysis uh, by our shot and coworkers, they also confirmed that rumen protected choline tended to reduce the incidence of retained placenta and mastitis. So I think I'll finish here. Might say some take-home messages for you before we get into the uh, next part of the of the webinar. But take-home messages are that that choline has many functions. Uh, including the support of ELDL synthesis. Right? Unprotected choline is subjected to ex extensive rumen degradation. You have to have um, a well-established form of protection to get it past the rumen and into the small intestine. Rumen-protected choline increases milcholine and choline-related metabolites, most notably betaine and phosphocholine. There's a consistent evidence that there's an improvement of liver health, increased milk, and energy-corrected milk production. There is an increase in dry matter intake with choline feeding, but it doesn't explain all the gains in milk yield. So there's other factors at play. And there's consistent evidence that uh, choline feeding can reduce postpartum diseases. Uh, and this principally includes mastitis, retained placenta, and ketosis. Currently, data would suggest that feeding 12.5 to 20 grams of rumen protected choline ion is best throughout the transition period. Well, which is especially beneficial in lower protein diets. So it's been my pleasure uh, to share this talk with you today. Uh, hopefully you learned a little bit about um, choline biology and nutrition in the transition dairy cow. And we'll take the moment here to pass the mic to Scott.
I thank you all. I wish to thank everybody for attending. It was really nice to give us some time this afternoon. I have the pleasure of introducing Vitacol DX, and it's truly a privilege to be able to represent a product that not only can make a difference in an individual dairy, but actually help our whole industry. Vitacol DX is a lumen inert choline supplement encapsulated with Duracoat technology, which is our proprietary coating designed to provide the highest level of durability in mixed feeds. On this slide, we kind of, it's a little busy. We have the product tag here. Um, I have a picture of the product. So we are a pellet. And the key numbers here are we, our pellet is 62% crude fat. So we coat the outside of this with a crude fat that takes up over half the product itself. So our feed rate is a little higher than other products out there. So it's a 0.16 feed rate, which should deliver about 17.4 grams of choline chloride and about a, a tenth of a pound of fat in that diet. And of course, it's available in 50 pound bags. A little bit on Duracoat technology. This is something that didn't just happen. It took over seven years to develop this technology. And we provide a, a combination of palmitic, steric, and oleic acids to give us the bypass on our, on our core that you see in the middle there. And the amount we protect was definitely something that we found we got the best bypass with and still provided that product to break down in the intestine and deliver choline to your to your cows. This gives us the best of both worlds because we're develop we are delivering a bypass fat that has a value to it and a core that gives you the choline that you should you should use in your animals to get the best health results. These next two slides are um, some basic bioavailability data. This is from our lab using in vitro, and we combine using the NRC method for bypass and the Ross method for digestibility. We are very confident in our bioavailability and consistency in delivering bypass choline. This next slide is our in vivo data done at the University of Nebraska, and they use the mobile bag technique and the nice, the nice thing about looking at these two slides is you're very comparable in not only bypass, but digestibility and total bioavailability. Both kind of confirm the fact that these are, this is bypassing and breaking down and, and being digestible in the animal. We're going to share some data from our first uh, farm trial. And as you can imagine, doing any transition data analysis is going to take a while. You're really waiting almost 60 days before you get anything usable, and you have to go out at least 90 afterwards to, to really lock things down. That first animal takes between 15 to 21 days just to hit fresh, and then events will happen and almost 60 to 70 days before she starts hitting peak milk. So the, these trials are long and prolonged and will continue um, to be measured over time. So this first herd was a 2,500 head herd in, in Midwestern US. They had not been free feeding choline previously. Uh, we implemented 70 grams of Vitacol per head per day for approximately 42 days. And again, cows don't always um, decide that they are our best friends in uh, fitting in a trial. We had some, of course, some, some close-ups that, that hit the fresh pen before their true 21 days were up. So nothing's ever perfect. We did use dairy comp to measure all our health events in this trial. One of the, some of the key numbers we'll, we'll catch um, that fresh line, the very first line, the previous year, and this is year over year data. The previous year, as you can see, we had over almost 100 less cows in the transition period than the year before. This, this dairy is a typical dairy. Um, when prices got up, they got a little more crowded. And so it prevented, it actually presented a bigger challenge than we in initially anticipated. And we were very pleased with the numbers we see on the reduction, the very last column to the right. Uh, basically across the board on meta metabolic diseases, we reduced every one of them. 
um, and had a, a truly uh, a, a good tribute to the choline nutrient as a, as a whole. It definitely works. Uh, the economics that we placed on the bottom here, you can see our reference at the bottom it is a DVM 360 model for costing on these diseases. But when we apply the reduction numbers, we come up with a, a little over a 1.8 return on investment, which follows very much to a lot of the industry saying anywhere from 1.5 to 2.0 on health. And, and that pretty much wraps me up. Um, with this, I, I wanted to let you know you can order this or get it on your farm now. Um, please contract your local rep, distributor partner, or nutritionist. And we can just work together on making your herds healthier. I am going to pass this back to, to Matt and Maris for questions. And if, if you have an easier one, that would be for me. If you have something really difficult, Dr. McFadden <laughs> is right here. Thanks, Scott. All right, thank you, Scott and Joe. We would like to open this up for questions. Um, as you can see on the screen, we have a little arrow up at the top that should open the question box for you. And you can type your question in and that will automatically be sent to us. And we should be able to view the questions as they come through. So please open it up for questions. All right, uh, Joe, I'm going to get started picking on you here if we could. Uh, I've got a multi-part question for you regarding bioavailability and choline. Uh, first, first part is, how important is bioavailability in regards to the benefits of choline supplementation? Okay, yeah, um, well, to answer this, you know, you know, without a doubt, bioavailability is important. And so it's, it's also important to define what that is. So choline bioavailability is what percent of choline as fed is available for the utilization by the cow and, and not for the rumen folks, okay? So, you know, all the meta-analyses I just showed you right there, they mention um, the results on a choline ion as fed basis. This does not represent, however, what's absorbed by the cow to be used for liver health or to make milk, okay? Um, you know, having a rumen protected supplement with a high bioavailability means that more choline that is fed is going to be used by the cow, right? It's not going to be degraded by the g bugs in the GI tract, all right? So, what I think I see the literature, I think many, many certainly report percent protected, rumen protected for different supplements. I think this is great. It's nice to know that information, but it does only provide a partial answer. Uh, and we also need to better understand post-ruminal degradation of these supplements. Uh, and I think only then can we understand what is truly available to the cow. Thanks, Joe. Uh, part two to that, do you think there's uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a need for a metabolizable choline recommendation or requirement similar to the requirements for methionine and lysine? Okay, Matt, you are bringing it here. Um, uh, regarding uh, metabolizable choline, in time, we should we should start reporting choline definitely on a metabolizable choline basis. I would say that the, the issue is that there's no perfect solution to assess intestinal digestibility. Uh, we also don't have enough research that directly translates intestinal digestibility data with what is actually being absorbed. I don't. I, I want to say that you know I know what Mike Van Amberg is doing, and I believe that there's good approaches that we can start with. Um, I think it's important to understand what is rumen bypass, but like I said up, up prior there, you know, under, understanding what uh, is intestinal digestibility is really going to help us get to metabolizable choline. I think once we start reporting it as metabolizable choline, then we can start to generate metabolizable choline recommendations. Great answer. Thank you. I'm going to flip to Scott for the next question that came in. What is the uh, approximate cost per cow per day for the Vital Coal product? All right, um, on our pricing, we are going to be, it's going to be a little regional basis, so I'm going to give you a range here. We we should be between 26 and 33 cents per head per day. 
Um, we will be competitive, and it's going to just depend on, on local handling freight as well. So it'll be a little different in regions in the United States. But we will definitely be competitive with the other products on the market and get that benefit of the fat as well, uh, especially in that fresh cow. Thank you, Scott. Another one from the audience uh, for Joe here. There's a, obviously a strong interaction between uh, choline and methionine. Does the feeding recommendation stay the same when you're feeding high levels of MP lysine and MP methionine? Um, yeah, okay. So, yeah, so if you look at like that meta analysis data, uh, I'm going to talk about it as on an as fed basis right now, but. Um, if you're thinking about what should the feeding level be at a low or high metabolizable methionine level, I think there there could be some differences in, in what you feed. And to get at this, I'll say that the benefits in milk and energy corrected milk, milk protein and fat yields, you know, 17 to 24 grams per day of choline chloride is a good range. And for those keeping track, that's about 13, 18 grams per day of choline ion. So when you look at that on that on that low end, staying I would say that keeping on that higher end, around 17, um, I should say, around 15 to 18 grams per day of choline ion, you can see good increases in in, in milk production with low MP. So that's low meaning less than 2.3% uh, metabolized methionine on a um, metabolizable protein basis. But I'd say that beyond that, then you sort of have decisions to make because let's just say that. Metabolizable methionine content is adequate, and so above 2.3. Um, then the gains in milk production, you, you might not necessarily see it. It's going to be fairly less responsive. That's what that's what I will say. Um, and I think that this is the time where you need to make sort of other decisions and look at other aspects of the herd. And so, like looking at herd health, is ketosis, uh, retained placentas, mastitis, are they issues? Um, look at management. Is there overcrowding? These animals have high body condition score. Then, if you can answer yes to some of the health questions, then choline feeding is is, is warranted. I would I don't think I have enough sort of information to know whether or not should you be feeding less choline because you're not getting the gains in milk. I would hypothesize potentially, and so feeding around at, at 12 grams per day of choline ion might be acceptable if you have a high um, uh, metabolizable methionine, a diet high in metabolizable methionine. For sure. And you, and you still have the potential, even though milk production is not going to change, you still have the uh, as great as if you're feeding a low uh, methionine diet, you're still going to get the um, effects on milk protein yield. And so that, that certainly deserves consideration. Great answer. Thanks, Joe. Uh, next question here. Uh, how should a practicing nutritionist go about deciding on a feeding rate for a rumen protected choline supplement? Yeah, so I mean, that's, those answers are pretty quite similar for me. Um, so, but I think it comes down to, um, for, for me, the initial decision is looking at the protein content in the diet. That, that's for me, that seems to be, if you're going to want the maximum kind of response, you really want to assess what's the current methionine st status in the diet. And I don't know about lysine. I know there's a question about lysine. I, um, to my understanding, that just haven't, hasn't been tested yet. But, but I, I think the same. Um, it, it's not necessarily the same because that methionine uh, sparing effect that you see with choline is in part due to how choline is metabolized. And so I don't think we can't treat that so, sort of outcomes the same for lysine. So, but I'm getting a little bit off track. But I would say the first part there is focusing on uh, the methionine status and sort of round two, looking at health status. And so um, I do think that there are situations where your milk production is high, you have adequate methionine in the diet, there's still a place for choline in the potential herd. That those decisions come down to herd health kind of decisions. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Joe. Uh, another one here, building on the synergistic effects between choline and methionine, would it be possible to feed some betaine to try to get similar effects and maybe cheat down the choline feeding rate? Yeah, so I, I've looked into the Betaine thing. I did a study with choline, methionine, and betaine, um, and I don't know the economics behind that. Um, but one, there's a caveat to that, and that that betaine um, only serves 
when you think about phosphatidylcholine production and, and that, the importance of that phosphatidylcholine to make VLDL and secrete triglyceride, that, that betaine is being used only in one of those two pathways that I talked about. And that's the methylation pathway. And in the cow, we really don't know um, yet about wh what proportion of total phosphatidylcholine production comes through methylation. Um, but, um, yeah, if you fed betaine, you could directly activate that pathway. But, uh, it's a big, big but there because in non-ruminants, um, majority of the phosphatidylcholine is made by the other pathway, the CDP choline pathway, and that doesn't require betaine at all. Um, and so, one of my concerns on the betaine story is, is that choline is, is rapidly converted to betaine. There's consistent evidence that that's one of the major metabolic states for choline. So what kind of implications does that have for making phosphatidylcholine through the CDP choline pathway? And we don't know that yet. Follow up there, Joe. Uh, would any dietary betaine be degraded to a similar degree as dietary choline? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, you know, there's some benefits there, though. Betaine is an interesting one, right? It's an osmolite, and, you know, they use a lot in, like, sort of heat stress kind of nutritional management, and it really has some benefits on, on nutrient digestion in the rumen. And so, yes, it, it is going to be metabolized in the rumen. Um, you're going to, but to get that sort of post ruminally, uh, you're, you're really one to protect it. And I do know that there's there's at least some products on the market that sort of are already putting betaine in an encapsulated form to do just that. But like I said, choline, choline really doesn't provide a lot of direct effects on sort of rumen nutrient fermentation, but B betaine is one that sort of does. And so it's, it's one of those unique things that if you had a rumen encapsulated betaine supplement, and let's say some of it actually, let's say the protection wasn't that great, um, you could still actually get some benefit because there's like some consistent ev evidence that uh, nutrient digestibility in the rumen increases with unprotected betaine, but anything that did get through that, that was fully protected would have direct effects on the host. I have, an, I have an, a slight interest in betaine, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> Understandable. Well, we've got one last question for you here. Uh, I know you've got some interest and experience in disappearance of choline in the lower gut. Can you uh, comment on where that choline goes and whether or not it's a productive use to the animal and how that affects bioavailability? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, yeah, this is a personal passion of mine. At American Dairy Science Association this year, we're going to start showing some new data. And um, we've known for some time that choline is is uh, degraded in the rumen. One of the products is a metabolite called trimethylamine. But we recently did a study where we abomasally infused choline. So we bypassed the rumen and we saw an increase in trimethylamine oxide in circulation. Well, trimethylamine oxide only comes from trimethylamine and trimethylamine is only formed from the microbial degradation of choline and carnitine as well. But in this case, we're talking about choline. And so this makes me wonder that and we have some evidence that post-ruminal choline degradation does occur. And if, you, if that is occurring to form trimethylamine, we are uh, potentially uh, reducing um, bioavailability. And so when we start thinking about some of these in vitro assays of intestinal digestibility um, that don't necessarily have um, the, that live microbiome component in it, uh, we might be overestimating um, uh, choline uh, bioavailability. So just, I don't know what the extent of that is, but it's worth an investigation. All right, very good. I uh, I think we're about out of time. I'm going to go ahead and hand it back to Maris here. I just want to thank everyone for attending. Um, this is the first in the Milk Specialties Global Webinar Series. We hope that you will join us for future webinars with partners that we have within the academic field. And just, I had a few questions come through as Matt was moderating the Q&A. Um, to confirm, we will be sending out a communication post presentation with a link to the presentation as well as PDFs of the documents. So everyone should be able to access those. And then as we had mentioned, all attendees will be automatically registered to receive a 
um, Yeti 65 Tundra cooler, which is pretty cool. It's got a uh, got a custom cow wrap on it. So we will review all of the attendees and select one at random and be notifying you as well. So thank you so much. We appreciate the time that you took. We hope that you learned something about choline. If you have any questions on Vital Coal, we encourage you to reach out to your milk specialties contact to get more information. And we look forward to connecting with you in the future. Thanks so much.